Welcome to the April 15th, 2024 Board of Education Workshop um, and regular Board of Education meeting. Please take a moment to silence your cell phone and then join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Um, John, do you mind taking a roll for us, please? Absolutely. President Rausch? Here. Vice President McFarland? Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Treasurer Lauterbach? Here. Member Blasey? Here. Member Ringgold? Here. Member Horowitz? Present. At this time, action item number two is request to address the board regarding the budget workshop. Again, please, for comments on the budget workshop, and then we'll have another section later for the regular meeting. Uh, first on my list, Mr. Bonadies for the budget. <clears throat> Thank you for joining. Greetings. Now that we've gotten the superintendent's selection process behind us, I have a question about the upcoming millage election. To be clear, I blindly voted for this millage in 1994, 04, and 14 with no recollection of the format. I am now a senior citizen on a fixed income, and the world has changed a lot in the last decade. I understand the need for the commercial properties paying the 18 mil non-homestead taxes, an age-old extortion by the state to, for you to get your allocation, and we're not going to change that. The part that was not clear to me was, was this one vote or two? All the PR said and, and was described in th the two parts individually, but it is actually one vote. After listening to Mr. Bruton's excellent explanation of where the hold harmless part comes from, I have some issues. In 1994, the state formula used numbers of students, shortfall from previous levels, home taxable value, meant that there would be a 5.6523 millage charge for each home. My taxable value has gone up 30% since the last time this passed. In the last two alone, it's gone up 10% with no improvements. So I'm aware of the potential liability you are asking us to agree to. And yes, all these means it's a tax increase. Taxable values are up, number of students are down, so the current millage rate is 0.4531 based on the state formula. So the point of this is, why are we authorizing this at the 1994 level? If the state were to change the formula, you are going to have an, a pre-approved ability to raise the millage with no input from the public up to a 12x on top of the higher taxable values. And as you may guess, I don't trust the state when times get tough. So I will be voting against the millage because the two parts are together and you have too much unfettered leeway if the state changes the formula. In the possible event that the millage fails, I would like to suggest you resubmit it for the November ballot with a 1 or 1.5 millage rate for hold harmless, preferably separated. This gives you a two to three time increase in the hold harmless, but not 12 times. You can even claim that you lowered something, though it would be only slightly relevant in this case. The homestead part is less than 1% of your budget, and there are a fair number of low-income seniors that would like to know that this cannot go up significantly in the future. Tying these two millages together is a sleight of hand to get the second one through. Again, this is not 1994. 5.65 is an irrelevant number based on previous Midland exceptionalism, and the world is a much less trusting place in 2024, something you should consider when you go for the big bucks in the upcoming bond. And... Uh, I'm glad to be here, despite the fact that the agenda said this meeting starts at 7 o'clock still. Thank you. Anybody else? Anyone else want to address the board regarding the budget workshop? Okay. <clears throat> Turn it over to... Mr. Bruton, I believe, on the budget. All set, Phil? Yep. All right, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to the 2024-25 budget workshop. It's hard to believe that it's April already and that we are at this point in the cycle of the school year. Um, the budget workshop, as a reminder to those of you that have not gone through this before, and for those of you that have but only see it once a year and need that quick reminder, the intention of the budget workshop is for us to give you a history of the financial position of the Midland Public Schools, give you a status check of where we are right now, 
give you a little bit of perspective information on where we stand within the state amongst our colleagues. And then we give you our very first glance at what we are looking at in terms of revenues and expenditures and what the state is talking about in their um, upcoming budget cycle. So that's our intention of this evening. You, of course, have the ability to stop me, pause me at any point in this presentation. If you wanna slow down, go back, ask questions, you do not have to wait until the end. Please feel free to chime right in and we can make this as interactive as we possibly can. So uh, this is us tonight, it's April 15th. It is your budget workshop. I will be back talking to you again in June. And that first meeting in June, I will propose to you the 24-25 budget. Um, it will also have the public hearing and proposed tax rates along with it. I'll be back for everyone for action on that budget on June the 17th. That will also include our final amendment of this fiscal year's budget as well too. So lots going on behind the scenes right now to get ourselves ready for the 24-25 budget cycle and also to wrap up our 23-24 budget cycle. Real quick, um, we wanna talk about what our current fund balance comp composition is. And I know that it's hard, you're gonna have to squint just a little bit, um, but basically what this slide is telling you is that we are in a solid fiscal position right now. Um, at the last board meeting, we gave you our projections on fund balance, and right now, currently sitting in Midland Public Schools, we're right around $32 million. If all things pan out the way that we have forecasted them, um, we look to be in a positive net position once more. Um, in the upcoming future. I'll talk more about that in a slide in a second. That number I gave you before, I wanna repeat this two or three different times, did not include fund modifications, which I'll go into a little bit deeper. Um, but in terms of raw dollars, you can see that we've been on a positive track. If you're looking at the dots that are scattered amongst that, that's our actual percentage. I've given you the warning about percentages and how they've kind of gone a little bit haywire on us in the past couple of years. And that's of course due to the influx of all of the ESSER dollars and some of the weird things that we had happen with the Midland co-generation venture tax settlement. Also, if you remember last year, we had some retirement flow through money that came in that was direct revenues and expenditures. So things got a little bit weird, um, but still a very, very healthy fund balance right now, which is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, remember it's to make cash flow. We do not get paid um, during the summer months. And because we don't get paid during those months, we do not want to have to borrow to make cash flow. And as I will point out much later in this presentation, it also allows you to make strategic decisions over time rather than very quick reactions if budgetary times were to shift on us, which we're foreshadowing they're going to within the next couple of years. So that healthy fund balance allows you to make very strategic decisions instead of reactionary decisions. Your quick snapshot here, again, this is what I presented to you back in March for our first budget amendment. This showed us finishing the year at a prediction of just over $35 million in our fund balance. But I do want to repeat for the second time this evening, this did not include fund modifications. And what that means is I have not taken dollars and pushed those into my capital improvements account for next year yet. Every single year, the director of operations and I sit down, we meet with the superintendent and cabinet, look at the capital improvements needed, and we make decisions on how much money we think we're gonna need for the next fiscal year for that. Historically, board, that's been right around the $1.5 million annual um, expenditures. We still have a touch of series two bonds left. Um, we were gonna do some roofs with those, but of course the Dow High Boilers quickly changed all of that. Um, we will be awarding that project at an upcoming meeting, and the numbers that are coming in on that are looking closer to the three quarters of a million to a million dollars for that project. So it's always important to be able to have a healthy cap capital improvements account um, to make sure that you could take care of any of those unanticipated needs. In terms of our overall expenditures in our current budget, we are predicting to come in just shy of 113 million. I hit this slide real hard last board meeting, showing that we of course are putting the majority of our dollars into instruction and supports. About 80% of those dollars are going there right now. And as a reminder, we are a human resources organization. Our people are our capital, and we are spending just under 85% of all of our dollars on salaries and benefits. I shift from our current status to a history. Um, and it's always important for us to review these because history, for those of us that love that subject, know that it tends to repeat itself. There are patterns, but we can also learn from the past um, to try and always strengthen what our net position is as a district. Our financial situation right now and its health can be attributed to several factors. Here's the first and primary important factor was enrollment stability. 
From 0809 to 1415, that's when our net position was decreasing each and every single year. Uh, we were averaging a loss of approximately 200 students per year. When you're losing approximately 200 students per year, the difficult part is aligning staffing to that. And you all know that when you lose that number of students, it's aligned to state dollars but it never just happens in a single grade level. When that's always spread out over time, it's tough to adjust staffing quickly to those, and you're always chasing those dollars because when you lose that um, revenue, it's very, very difficult to overcome. But from 1516 to 2324, we saw periods of stability um, from dropping 210 kids a year to dropping only an average of 40 students per year. That slow in enrollment drop has really allowed us to focus on stabilizing our financial position. And we attribute that to a lot of things. Um, we made some strategic decisions. We added a Young Fives program, STEM programming, IBPYP, PASS, an alternate certification or an alternate pathway to a high school diploma, all kinds of things we believe helped stabilize those enrollments. It helped us capture more of the birth rate than we have before. All of our enrollment projections show that the birth rate is not increasing. When we are remaining stable, it's us capturing a higher percentage of that birth rate rather than people choosing alternate pathways for their education. Um, we shared with you a couple of um, letters back that our enrollment projections project stability. Um, they don't show them changing that much in the next five or so years. We're going to continue to monitor those. Um, it's something that we really, really pay quick attention to. And you can see, this just reiterates the point that I was making. You can see that for a long time, that stable drop of 200 students per year, um, we had a period of relative stability. COVID threw a big wrench into that, not just us, but for every single public school district in the state of Michigan. And you can see that we have another period of stabilization that's happened after that as well, too. That stability, again, allows us to strategically staff and to be able to maintain programming at the levels that we want to. State funding is the second piece. It's not just the number of students you have, but it's the amount of dollars that you're getting per student as well, too. So on top of losing almost 210 students per year, during that same time period, the foundation allowance was decreasing by $113 per student per year. So you had a double compounding um, impact on the district, which again um, led to certain decisions such as school closures and concessions from employee groups. But from 1415 to 2324, we're back on the right track. I, again, do not ever want to have anyone think that I'm not thankful for the dollars that we get, but $156 per student per year over time has not kept up with CPI. Um, and so we have been fortunate in the past couple of years to get four and 5% increases, but the norm has been much more in that one to two-ish percent um, as a district. In a few slides, you're gonna hear me show you and say to you what our projected annual increase in expenditures is, it's usually typically in that five to 7% range. That's not just salary increases for employees, but also remember we have steps and we have lanes. As employees gain tenure and seniority, of course their compensation packages increase as well too. We cannot ever get past this slide without saying thank you again to our voters for the 2015 bond. That bond allowed us to take our capital projects budget um, and largely push it into that bucket of dollars, which freed up a lot of our general fund dollars, and we did not have to do sizable capital improvement transfers like I talked about a couple of slides back. Uh, our employees did help during those tough times as well, too. From 1011 to 1617, um, there was not the ability within the district to give any raises, but we are happy to say that as our position has um, gained strength, we've restored raises in the 1718 school year, and for the past seven consecutive years, we've been able to give our employees um, additional salaries each and every single year. There were other decisions made along the way. Um, administration was restructured. There was retirement incentives or other people call those buyouts. Grant procurement, um, we've really done a great job in bringing in additional funds outside of the foundation allowance. And of course, our annual variance, which is strategically using our funds, watching every single dollar and making sure that we're maximizing on bid savings and not just having um, spending that is not within the um, allocation of our intended expenditures. And this will take a little bit of focus this evening. We did also benefit, like most school districts out in the nation, from about $13.3 million of supplementary funds that came to us for all of the COVID dollars. 
There was ESSER 1, ESSER 2, ESSER 3, there's 23G. I'll stop with the acronym so Penny doesn't give me a, a look on there. Um, but we all do know that these funds up, must all be spent by September of 24. Um, so these dollars will run out. Um, we'll talk more about that when we get to a couple of slides. But this has also assisted us in adding strategic programming, strategic projects to help students weather the effects of the pandemic. I know, Phil, you like these slides, so we will stop and we'll slow down here a little bit. And I always like to catch myself on these and see that if what I said last year and our predictions were to have come true, these have changed and they've ebbed and flowed a little bit over the past couple of years because of the way that dollars have been allocated to different districts based on poverty levels. But um, we use this as our calibration. So what you're really looking at in all of these fancy colors, you want to focus on the highlighted yellow. That was last year's performance as a district. You'll see that in the top left, it shows that there were 817 operating school districts in the state of Michigan last year. It will then break down for you what your general fund revenues were per pupil based on the different categories. It also then gives you a rank amongst all of the other districts in the state of Michigan. And what you should really focus in on in this slide is if you're going to take a look at total sources. So in terms of total sources that are coming into the district per pupil, you could see that Midland Public has found themselves right in the middle of the pack in the state of Michigan. And if this were to go back years and years and years, we were typically toward the front of that pack. But as there have been restructures to the finances of the state and how they've allocated funds, we are right about in the middle. You can't get much closer than that. And we believe that that probably is going to stay in that region for a while. The ebbs and flows that you see in some of the other ones were because of the way that the state has allocated their federal sources. Remember, I have explained to you that when they were giving out pandemic relief funds, it was based upon your percentage of poverty, not on your total student population. And there were districts that had hundreds of millions of dollars, where again, we were right around that $13.3 million range. Beneficial, but not to the level of where some other districts were. So Brian, the, the inflows are inclusive of ESSER dollars and any of the flow throughs from the retirement payments as well? Correct, okay. they are. I was just looking at the, you know, we jump from eight to 10, but then we'll come back down, I assume. Certainly will. Right, okay. In terms of our expenditures pupil, per pupil, this is where you wanna to be toward the um, lower end of these because this is talking about instructional programs. And if you're taking a look at instructional salaries and benefits, it puts you right in that 200 range, of course, in that top quartile in the state. When we're talking about expenditures per pupil, these are the slides that we typically focus on and say that you should be very proud of your operations and maintenance team because when you're taking a look at that number, it puts you very toward the top of the pack, which means that you are operating in a very efficient manner. We had predicted that your business and administration would move slightly toward the middle of the pack, and that was because of our addition of what we call SELs, or Social Emotional Learning Managers. Um, those get classified within that business and administration rank, and when you're adding six additional employees, um, of course, that's going to affect that ranking. Know that those are for the service of the teachers. Those were intended to help teachers gain the skill sets um, for all of the social emotional work that we have going on so that those skill sets would then be embedded once our pandemic funding ran out. So we predicted that this would happen. Um, if we maintain these positions into the future, we expect that we're gonna be right around that range as well too. But these are slides again that are typically points of pride, but also do point out that um, when it comes to our spending in these areas, um, a little bit more investment is something that we shouldn't ever shy away from. And we added this last year. Um, we hadn't done this historically before, but we always wanted to put our average teacher salaries on there. You could see that we've historically been in the 50s, um, and then we moved to 109. I had to dig into this a little bit because it wasn't making sense to me. And then when I went back and took a look, we have been averaging around 30 to 35 retirements annually. And when you are getting in that range and you're bringing in people that are on the lower end of the scale versus people retiring at the top end of the scale, that's where that data shift has gone a little bit. Um, this won't catch up to us for a bit, 
but something very unique that we saw this year was a low number of retirements. I think we're, Jeff, only at around 12 or 13. And so that number in a year or two is going to trail and dip back down again, and then we should probably see it level back up again. Um, but this bulletin 1014 is something that we always like to focus in on to give ourselves a comparison um, on where we are falling within the state of Michigan. So for revenue factors, this is what we're looking at for next year. We're watching enrollment like a hawk. Um, we are currently looking at all of the proposed categoricals from the state. Um, and of course, we are planning for our ESSER and 11T funding expiration very, very carefully. We went through a very intense programmatic evaluation process to figure out what we could sustain that was working. And also if we had the expected revenues to be able to assist with that. Of course, expenditures, we are estimating right now based on staffing levels needed, um, what our compensation levels need to be, benefits and retirement. I said before, it is an exceptionally low year in terms of retirement. That's great for retention of veteran, highly effective teachers. Um, it does put a bit of a challenge onto staffing because when you have 30, 35 teachers leave, there's lots of spots that need to be filled. When there's not as many leaving, it prevents um, or presents certain challenges. Our other 15% of the budget sometimes gets a lot of attention. Um, it is certainly not the highest level of expenditures we have because people are our highest level of expenditures. But we have, over the course of the past month and a half, met with every single principal, every single department leader, all managers, um, to talk about what their needs are for next year. And we've line item all of those needs and we'll prioritize those as our expected revenues come in. I wish I had more here, people, for you. Um, but at this point, all I have for you in terms of what we are hearing from the legislature is the executive budget. Um, so what you see there are blanks for the Senate and the House. We're waiting for those to be released. Typically, once we get all three budgets, we find the average of all three, take our best guess, and that is the budget that we're bringing to you. But basically what this budget shows for you this year is um, about a 2.5% increase in expected revenues. We are expecting many of the categoricals or special funding lines to continue, but we are very carefully watching those. You've heard me trumpet and say over and over and over, these budgets that have been released by the state in the past couple of years have been the most categorical, heavy budgets that we have ever seen. It's great because it gives you additional supports, they scare me and keep me up at night because all it takes is, and they're gone, um, when they're not built into the foundation allowance. So basically what we're seeing is about a 2.5% increase. Most of the categoricals continuing. I did put a star down by GSRP funding because that is something as a district that we are watching extremely carefully. The governor had said before that she was anticipating to have free preschool for all. I believe, Penny, it was by 27 Thank you for affirming that. And in her budget proposal this year, threw us a bit of a knuckle curveball um, and said, not then, now. And so that has sent us into some rapid work on the pre-primary center. We're not going to sink millions of dollars into it. But if there is going to be free preschool for all, we need to be prepared and we need to be ready to be able to accept those students. So you will be seeing at board meetings some work coming to you for some quick renovations to make the pre-primary center um, acceptable for adding additional slots should they become available in the Senate and the House's budget. So we're positioning ourselves to be able to be ready for that. This is important. I showed this to you in the last one, but your categorical surge. Nearly half of the school aid budget this year is siloed dollars. And those are dollars that don't just have the ability to spend them as you need them. Those are dollars that come with grant ramifications, which means applications, rules, paperwork, and sometimes they have temporary and unknown and unpredictable timelines to them as well. I stole this. This is not my slide. These were from our good friends over um, at the Saginaw ISD. And this is what was the governor's proposed budget. If you see a solid line, that is foundational money. And if you see dashed lines, those are categoricals. So you can see the large amounts of categoricals that we have to make educated guesses on if they're going to continue or not. And the issue for us is if we guess wrong, it's typically too late in the staffing process to do things about them. Which is why, team, I want to remind everyone as a board that a solid financial position with a good fund balance, should one of those dash lines go away, gives you the ability to strategically carry those initiatives 
forward for a period of time, your fund balance can catch you and save you from having, again, to make very quick reactionary decisions. So it's a good, good thing to be in a solid net position. Here's what we're taking a look at in revenues. If our predictions come true, um, I plugged in a drop of 35 in enrollment. That's kind of where it's trending to be right now. We'll continue to look at that. And if you see an increase in the foundation allowance that was at about 2.5%, you're looking at about a $2 million increase in revenues coming to us from the state, if that all holds true. In terms of expenditures, um, I'll spend just a touch more time here. Um, know that when we do predict our expenditures, it is taking into account our salary increases, but also our employee steps, our lane changes like talked about before. Medical costs, we do not have what those specific increases are going to be, but we predict them to be right around 8%. I know it says 4 but we only get charged half in a year. That's a whole bunch of behind-the-scenes business office stuff. So we're predicting an 8% increase in medical costs. And then, of course, in departmental budget requests, we've gone through those, and we're looking about three-quarters of a million dollars in additional requests over this year um, for initiatives, strategies, supplies, materials that folks need. Um, to cover what these expenses are. We do a little bit of quick math. I told you our prediction for foundation allowance increase is 250, and you could see that we would need around $600 of a foundation increase to be able to cover what all of our anticipated expenditure increases would be. It's a deficit of around $350, which is why our advocacy will always be give us to those in the foundation, not into categoricals because it will allow us to spread those over items that our strategic analysis and our continuous improvement plans tell us that we need. Here's our variables enrollment. We're going to continue to watch that. State and local funding, like I said, I wish I had all three budgets to give you right now. I don't. Um, I will hopefully in June have a little bit clearer picture for you. Medical costs have been odd through the pandemic. Um, they actually got cheaper during the pandemic because people weren't going to the doctor. Now everyone's going to the doctor again. And so those have been kind of interesting for us to watch. And then, of course, ESSER funds are expiring at the conclusion of 24. Okay. A deep breath because I'm talking fast. But I want to stop and pause here for a second as a board, and I want to tell you two things. The first thing that I want to tell you is um, we are going to present to you again in May. And in May, we are going to bring in our grants team, and they're going to walk you through the process that we used in Midland Public to analyze all of the ESSER initiatives to see what was working, the impact that they were having, did we need to eliminate? Did we need to enhance? Did we need to modify and adjust? They've done a phenomenal job, and you're really going to enjoy that presentation. Um, Penny's going to allow me to talk during that presentation just a little bit about the dollars um, because we do need to talk about that. And I put a chart here that I know everyone's squinting at. I'll give you the abstract of it. Something odd happened to us during the pandemic. Um, that did not happen to every single school district in the state of Michigan. In the middle of all of the ESSER funding, we here in Midland Public also were blessed that we became full recipients of the at-risk formula. Historically, we were receiving, if you see an FY22 squint real good, about $700,000 per year. And you can see when we became full recipients, that vaulted to around $3 million a year. At the same time, a grant called 31AA came around. We had never gotten those dollars before, and we received about $1.8 million to focus on social emotional wellness. At the same time, a grant that had been around for a long time called 31N6 started increasing at rates much higher than we had ever anticipated. In the middle of ESSER, we received an additional approximate $4 million in funds that we did not plan. And we did not plan on spending those dollars because we had already come up with our ESSER 3 plan, aligned our ESSER 3 budgets to all of those, then all of a sudden these dollars became available. We made very strategic decisions at that time to spend some of those revenues, but also to defer some of those revenues. The deferral of those revenues mean that we will present to you in May and show you that we have the ability to not only sustain, but also enhance almost all of our ESSER initiatives for another two to three years. Um, so that's a great thing. Um, this took a lot of work for people behind the scenes that you don't get to see very often. Penny has invited Lori Holderby, 
and John McClelland and all those folks to the next board meeting, they won't want to talk, but they'll wave to you from the back. Um, the number of, if you're an accounting person, journal entries that those people had to do, grant applications, movement of dollars to be able to make all this work um, really is something um, that was a Herculean effort for that team. So with that, um, I just wanted to tee this up um, that at the next board meeting, more is to come, but you have all been reading about the fiscal COVID cliff and the number of school districts that have had to cut, 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 cut. That time for us is not now. There may come a time. Um, it's looking and forecasting two to three years out that we'll have to make some additional decisions, but hopefully by that time too, with the very strategic utilization of your fund balance, you also could choose as a board to continue some of those initiatives as well too. So stay tuned, more to come. I know I'm running out on time here, so here's what we're looking ahead to. I told you I'll be back to you in June. Um, the very first board meeting, I will have my first presentation of the 24-25 budget. Really, really hoping that I have the House and the Senate to give you a better prediction. If not, we'll go with what our gut tells us based off of the executive. You don't vote on it then, you vote on it on the 17th. That gives you some time to take a look at it. On the 17th, you'll vote once on that budget and you'll also vote again to amend our 23-24 budget for the final time. With that, um, I've run right up into my half hour allotment and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have or provide additional information as we poise ourselves to really dig into the next fiscal year's budget. You mentioned in there you're forecasting a loss of 38 students, potentially, for next year's budget. 35, but close. 30, okay. yes, yes, sir. Um, but we are doing a mad scurry to prep four or five or six new classrooms at the pre-primary center? Correct. And the addition of the people in those classrooms will... How does that offset our loss? What are you predicting is going to be added right. to the pre-primary um, so center? So those students, Brad, aren't Are they included. not in the count? That's correct. Okay. They're, they're in a separate count. And I had a fancy slide here. Um, see the star, there you go. Um, and I know that's hard to see, team. But the other thing that happened that was very interesting is the governor proposed funding preschool students at a higher foundation level than normal. I've never seen that before. It usually was the opposite or vice versa. Um, and so we believe that the revenues that would come in would fully fund the staffing levels that we need as well too. We had to apply for, they're called slots, um, for preschool and we've applied for 100 um, where our current levels are 60, but they're half time slots. Jeff, I'm pointing to you because you oversee that. Um, we don't know if they're coming or not, but we really wanna be ready. We don't wanna leave money on the table and we want the kids in the door at our pre-primary center. We really have a high belief in the effectiveness of that program and so we wanna be ready. Okay. Brian, if it, just staying on the preschool subject for a second, does that, if this is funded, can we then mix our GSRP students and tuition-based students into the same classrooms in the building? We've discussed that. Um, it, the way it's looking right now, Phil, is that even though the cap will be taken away, mm -hmm. it will still be income based, okay. based on where you fall in. The, so if I have a hundred slots and there are 200 students that want into the program, it would be the 100 that fit into the end of the income cap. Got it. Um, so we've talked about that. Um, but we don't know, A, how many slots we're going to get, B, how this is all going to shake out, or C, if the Senate and House are going to say, that was a great plan, but no. Yeah, yeah. So, again, calculated risks here, which, again, when we're going to be asking you to put some money into the pre-primary center, you're not going to see millions. But we need to make it acceptable. Yeah. Okay. It, anybody else on the board have questions? Brian, I don't think you said it during this presentation, but I certainly heard you talk about, when we talk about the expiration of ESSER and 11T funds, the money that we used for that work, for the programming, we're constantly evaluating the programs and we'll continue to do so, correct? And then kind of when we're really out of that money, that's when we'll determine what programs we thought were effective and what should go forward. Yeah, it'll be round two of that, and um, Again, at the next meeting, you'll hear our grant team talk about what we did this spring in terms of evaluation. Um, for those of you that love educational research, 
Um, a time span of only two to three years doesn't ever really give time for things to, there's a fancier word than sink in, uh, but to have an impact or effect size. Um, and I don't want to steal Penny's thunder um, because she led these. <laughs> you were going to make a joke there. Yeah, I said that the other day and yeah. Um, but um, we will have a second round and to address your question um, in a couple of years to really dig into where we need to continue to invest our dollars. But I do want to remind you all as well too, that's why you have a fund balance. Because if at the end of two or three years, it looks like everything is working, which isn't likely, but if everything is working, you could choose to fund the continuation of those with fund balance if revenues haven't um, crept up by that time. So it's a good position to be in. I'm excited to see that presentation next month. And you know, I just got to have to commend the team on your forethought to make sure that we had these dollars. I know we talked about it for three years and saying we need to study what works. And now we're at that time where we've studied what works. And fortunately, we're in a budget position where we've, we've saved enough money so that we can complete the longitudinal studies on really what is most effective and has the best outcomes on students. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't say thank you for all the work that the team has done on 31A and also say thank you to Representative Glenn and, and, and Senator Stamas who worked on that hard for us and um, helped, helped to make sure that we got the 31A because you can see the direct impacts on what it does for our at-risk students. Um, and then finally, just want to say thanks for the work on the bottom-up budgeting. I know that process is not easy, but having the input of our staff and in particular our principals and building leaders um, to build a bottom-up budget is, is very helpful. So, I'm glad you noticed you. that. It is a lot of work, and there are weeks where Brian and the business office team are sequestered in a room and principals and department heads just sort of cycling in to um, offer their input and I think it does create a more student-centered budget mm -hmm. when it's done. If we might Phil just for a moment since uh, Hold Harmless was mentioned in Brian's presentation could you just explain again uh, given the May 7th vote uh, the work that goes behind determining uh, that rate that we levy and some of the logistics behind our, our cap of $122 per student. Certainly. Um, first week of May every year I get an email from one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. His name is Howard Heideman. Um, he works at the Department of the Treasury and that email includes a spreadsheet um, that has a statutory formula that sets the rate um, that I am allowed to levy. Um, without getting too much into the weeds, when that was established in 1994, that was about 415 bucks a kid. That was based on how much over the foundation Midland was at that time, et cetera. You were capped at that rate. You could not collect any more than $415 per student forevermore until there was a change in legislation. That change in legislation came a couple of years back where that cap was changed from 415 to 122. It is exceptionally important board to know that the state makes up that difference. So we're not losing the revenues from 122 to 415. We're just having to collect less of that from our citizens. So when they change the rates from 415 to 122, you may remember a board meeting, we we're actually over in Central Auditorium, where we had to do an amendment to our tax rate, something that hadn't been done in years and years and years because we had established our rates based on previous legislation where we were collecting $415. And then when you change it to 122, that of course drops your rates. We were around the 16s, 1.7s, and then we quickly went below one mil. So um, that calculation will come to me again um, in a couple of weeks here. And that calculation has two parts. I'm predicting how many kids I'm gonna have next year. I'm predicting property values. And from that, I take 122 bucks times the number of kids and then figure out how many mills I need to levy to be able to get that amount of dollars. So I predict property value increases. I predict enrollment. That's part one. <coughs> part two was, and this is why I lost all of my hair rather than just some of it, 
was I right or was I wrong the previous year? If I guessed wrong on property values or if I guessed wrong on students, you have to catch up. That catch up is either levying fractions of additional mills or reducing the current levy as well too. Typically it's reducing um, because we always try to be conservative um, when we're making those estimates. But again, because we're throwing a dart at the dartboard, um, more than just a dart, we really put some time into these metrics to try and make sure we guess right. Um, we have to um, make those predictions. I bring those to you the first week of June. Um, that's a part of that first budget presentation. I don't own my enrollment. Um, we always have to predict. And if I'm off by a bit, that's the second part of that formula. So um, that formula, in the ballot language, it says we are going to get about $900,000 in revenue. That's true. That's what's being collected from the primary taxation. But don't forget that there's a clause in our state A where the state makes up the rest of those dollars. So not doing that would have a much higher impact on MPS. Um, that's something that is tough to put onto a postcard. Um, and it gets a little bit into the weeds sometimes on those, but it is very important to us. The inclusion of those two in the same ballot language um, is what was necessary to make this an actual renewal. If we were to have tweaked at those formulas, then it would not have been a renewal, and we did not want to create something new that we thought would lead to more confusion. Um, so the intent was not to deceive. Um, the intent is to truly carry forward um, a pure renewal from what was passed a couple of decades back. Historically, um, as we've shown in the slides, the rate has been decreasing. Um, we know the economy goes up, it goes down, kids go up, they go down, um, and we've looked at our crystal balls and we believe it's going to be relatively stable. How does the amount that we'll be asking for in the May 7th election compare to other districts around the state? That's a difficult question to answer okay. because there are not many hold harmless districts left, John. Okay. Um, as the formulas have changed, I believe originally, I just read this stat, 50 two, one, three, somewhere in that range, okay. original hold harmless district. I believe the last time I checked um, was somewhere in the 20s, um, but that changes each and every single year of hold harmless districts left. So not many district ask for hold harmless. Okay. All, all is a tough statement. I would guess 99.999% of them um, have an operating millage, the non-homestead, and there are some that levy higher than 18 because of something called a Headley override. Not for today, I'm already over on this. Um, but I would guess, Penny, it's probably safe to say, all or very near close to all do an operating millage. They have to, to be able to make up those chunks of their budget, John. Yeah. What is our current mills on the Hold Harmless? 0 0.4531. Yeah. I don't know next year's yet. Again, I get my sheet from Howard in a couple of weeks here and I'll start working on those calculations and we'll see how we did. Any further questions for Brian? All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Move into the consent agenda. Item number 4.1 is approval of the minutes from March 18th, 2024 regular meeting and the March 20th, 2024 special meeting. Item 4.2, our employee leave absence request. Um, item 4.3, the below staff have announced their resignation effective on the following dates as listed in your agenda packet. Item 4.4, approval of the payment of the school system's bills for the month of February 2024 as listed in the check registers prepared by Ms. Holderby in the amount of $7,935,000. $611 is recommended. The distribution of obligations by fund is included in the documentation. Item 4.5 is approval. Approval is requested to authorize legal payments to the below list of professional legal fees through and law firm PC for $2,702.50 and Posnack Dyer Karnaschewski Thompson for $1,915.80. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Support. Motion by Lauterbach, support by McFarland. Any discussion? 
All in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item five. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Good evening, Shining Star Time. Let's have Mackenzie come on up. You're going to get double clap. Claps at the beginning and claps at the end. Come on over and stand by me. I'll let you hold this while I say some wonderful things about you. Thanks for being here. All right, our first shining star is Mackenzie Kirkman. She uh, works at Midland High currently. She began her journey here in 2019 when she was hired as a paraprofessional at Northeast Middle School. She returned to MPS in 2021 as a paraprofessional at Midland High before transitioning to the position of registrar and counseling at Midland High, the position which she currently holds. Mackenzie earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Child and Family Development from the American Military University. Here are some wonderful things that people have said and why you're a shining star. You've done an amazing job working with Midland High students of all ages to help register them for the College Board before the PSAT SAT week of testing in April. And can we just pause and say that's a lot. It's a lot. We have some big shifts with PSAT, SAT, College Board testing. It's all digital now, and there's a lot of work to be done with that. So thank you for that. All students who cannot log in visit your office, and you're able to find a solution for every single one of them. True? Most of every them, single I one. I love it. <laughs> Whether you try different password strategies or assist them when they call the College Board directly, you are there to help them navigate the website and the dreaded help desk at College Board. <laughs> Additionally, you have been diligent in following up with students who are absent. We couldn't have registered every student at Midland High without your help. Thank you for being a shining star. You're welcome. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, yes, please. High fives, fist bumps. You're good. You can just give them a wave. I know it's a lot. It's a lot being up in front of people. I'm going to have the next two come up together, if they would, please. They're, they're sort of a dynamic duo here. And uh, you might know that the Voices of Our Community event happens at Jefferson. Uh, these two have been instrumental in making that happen. Uh, Jennifer Lehman, come on up, and Karen Staley. So I'm going to read a little bit about oh sandwiches. this is awesome yeah. <laughs> you can hold your bags just thank you oh thank you this is great <laughs> to the <laughs> happiest people i know karen let's read your career highlights you joined the mps team in 1994 as a sixth grade teacher at adams and then you transferred to jefferson in 2003 to teach sixth grade which is where you've been ever since happily Karen earned her Bachelor of Science and Master of Arts degree in education from Central Michigan University. Jen, on the other hand, <laughs> uh, joined our team in 2003 as a science teacher and has shared that position at Jefferson Middle School and Midland High at the time. I actually didn't know that. Yeah. You traveled. Okay. <laughs> yes, I did. From there, you taught seventh and eighth grade science and physical education at Jefferson before teaching Life Skills 101 at Jefferson, which is the position you currently hold. We've revitalized that yes, program. It's so <laughs> awesome. You earned your Bachelor of Science and Master of Arts degree in education at Saginaw Valley State University. 
So this event requires a ton of coordination to get every eighth grader enrolled in one of these sessions to make sure that all of the presenters are there for the voices of our community and that the whole day goes without a hitch and that they eat that yes. so our life skills <laughs> class actually prepared the food this year yes. for all of those guest presenters which was really special i'm going to read the same statement because you both have a similar statement as to why you're shining stars Together, you co-organized this grade level awesome event called Voices of Our Community for over 300 students. It included approximately 20 speakers who were invited to share their unique experiences with our eighth graders at Jefferson. This event involved many hours of calling, looking at spreadsheets, <laughs> uh, confirming with guest speakers, organizing the schedule for the event and providing lunch, as I said, prepared by our students. It was a highly successful event, rave reviews. Thank you so much for your Thank work you. in doing that and for being shining stars. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations to you, too. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, you can go give some high fives, okay. fist bumps. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then next up, we have PYP updates. <laughs> so this is extra special tonight because we get the adults and the students yes, presenting. Yes, we have kids. <laughs> and of course, uh, our awesome PYP team and Jen. All right, so we'll get started. Good evening, as always. Thank you for the invitation to join this evening's board, board meeting. We're excited to re-engage you in the overall PYP framework and philosophy, provide you with an update about the next evaluation cycle process, and most of all, hear from our awesome students about their elementary PYP journey and exhibition. As Penny stated, my name is Jen Service, and I am joined this evening by two of our PYP coordinators, Jillian Seamster and Whitney Jacobs, and some amazing fifth grade students from Central Park. The heart of the PYP lies in the learner profile. All IB programs aim to develop internationally minded people who recognizing their common humanity and shared guardianship of the planet help to create a better and more peaceful world. These 10 attributes can help individuals and groups become more action-minded citizens and more responsible members of local, national, and global communities. As you know, approaches to teaching and learning have shifted over time. As PYP teachers and learners, we engage in a much more inquiry-based approach that honors agency, voice choice, and ownership. This provides the differentiation needed to support our diverse learners. We focus on more effective and intentional teamwork and collaboration. We engage students in larger conceptual ideas for understandings. For example, when thinking about topics such as habitats and ecosystems, we study those through the conceptual lens of growth and change, making larger local and global connections to the world. Finally, ongoing formative and summative assessments guide our next steps in teaching and learning. One of the core elements of our IB PYP evaluation process is our in-person visit. During this time, an IB evaluator will visit each one of our elementary buildings to see what our engagement with the IB framework looks like. Prior to this evaluation cycle, evaluations were very compliance-based, in which boxes of criteria were checked. Since our last evaluation cycle, IB has transitioned into a more collaborative evaluation, in which we incorporate what is called a program development plan. This plan allows the building as a whole to engage in a continuous cycle of inquiry, action, and reflections that reflect the school's context and strategic goals. This process will allow us to intertwine the work that we are already engaging in with our literacy implementation plan and each school's MyKIP team. IB PYP coordinators and district administrators will begin the process of preliminary documentation for in-person visits in the fall of 2025. 
Our self-study and development of the program development plan will take place in the winter of 2026, followed by the in-person visit in spring of 2026. I knew I should have wore heels here. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of exhibition, which is just one of the things that we will share with our visiting team when they come. But I also just wanted to give you a little precursor so that when our students share in a minute, that you have a little background of what they've been doing. So exhibition is our culminating culminating event for our students at the end of their PYP journey and it's also a celebratory event as our students transition from elementary to middle school and it takes place of course at the end of their fifth grade year and the goals of our exhibition are centered around student agency and most importantly student action so our students to uh, start out by choosing a real world issue or topic of high interest to them we want them to select topics that are significant, relevant, and authentic to them, and they will share their topics tonight and why they chose them. But really, it's empowering that student agency that, so that our students have choice and voice and ownership of their learning, and it's more self-directed during exhibition. From there, we assist our students in helping uh, them write some open-ended questions that guide their research to become more knowledgeable on the topic. And as our students are researching, we, the teachers and their mentors, encourage them to uh, source out different resources than just the internet. So our mentors, um, they've been staff members, they are community members, former board members have been mentors, PTO staff. So it's a lot of uh, community engagement. But they help the students either you know, take part in firsthand experiences or conduct interviews, come up with some surveys, field visits so that our students can understand their issue from multiple perspectives. As you can imagine, as Jen mentioned before, the learner profile is at the heart of the PYP, and our students um, absolutely have opportunities to demonstrate all of those throughout this process. They're applying their skills and knowledge from all subject areas, particularly reading, writing, the sciences, social studies, depending on their topics. And what really uh, extends exhibition beyond just a standard research project is the action. So all of our students come up with an action proposal that aligns with their topic with the help of their teacher and mentors. And they decide what action will look like from them. Um, it might be something that's within our school, within our community, or within the greater uh, world. So that could be coming up with a solution to a problem or raising an air awareness about an issue or participating in a local project that they themselves have organized. So tonight we have two groups from Central Park Elementary. They just had their exhibition prior to spring break, so it was perfect timing for this board meeting. Um, we have a recycling team, which is going to share first. Uh, so please welcome Ryan, Tori, and Nona. your board closer to you? Um, do you, you want to do it here? Or can they come closer to you? Okay. Um, so our type topic is um, recycling. It was pretty much just finding out um, like what's like um, like recycling, like how much um, the like we recycle. Like we each got um, different topics, um, like change responsibility and per um, perspective, like which would be Tori. We each um, research researched about them. We each had our own little men we each had our own mentor that would help us out every week. Um, after lunch on Tuesday. She was a big help um, in this project and um, it was really fun learning about recycling and um, like all the things that like we've learned about. It's been really fun working with my group and my friends and um, I'm excited to share with you guys tonight. Our action uh, plan was we wanted a paper recycling bin for our school because we found out that we couldn't recycle paper. 
there's a recycling bin, but it only took cardboard. And what we did is we emailed Mr. Bunking Muggenberg, asking him for a paper recycling bin. Um, he said we don't need one because we can recycle paper with the cardboard. So we sent an email out to all these teachers telling them uh, like the do's and don'ts of what to recycle because the janitor told us like he ain't going to dig through everything. So, um, and then we also interviewed Mrs. O'Hare about uh, recycling because she used to work in the middle of recycling. She used to volunteer. So. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, basically, um, I, I, I honestly really enjoyed working with my our, my group, I was able, to, and I was really happy to work with my greatest friends. And I was, I I thought learning about new things and recycling was really fun. And I realized, um, like, like me and Nona, we didn't talk as much. And then this this brought up together. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, anyways, anyways, anyways. So, um, uh. Yeah, but I really enjoyed working with my group, and I was happy to um, share this experience with them. And that's, like, one of my favorite parts of, about this project, and I was really happy to work with my good friends and my group. Um, the coolest thing that I thought about or learning about um, recycling was that we create about 300 thousands um, plastic waste each year by using plastic shopping bags and half of them like no more than half um, just get dumped like thrown away dumped into the oceans like they're not really used um, again so um, only one percent of them gets recycled and that's like not a very um, high chance which is um, kind of sad and I thought it was really great about how Michigan has um, changed from their um, over time because Michigan used to be at 14.25% um, um, for like, their recycling progress, but yet they are almost at 35.4%, which is a really big and awesome jump for recycling. But the U.S. made an even bigger jump starting at almost just 7% recycling, and now they're almost at 35%, which is a really big um, percent, and I'm really glad um, that they have improved in recycling. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, my favorite part uh, was probably like researching on my questions. Like my favorite one was like, how much uh, recycling uh, has been like how much plastic has been produced in the U.S. each year, which it says over four hundred million plastic tons. Uh, or like tossed into the grounds, like weren't were just thrown away, and then it also said over ten million tons um, were thrown into our oceans. Um, Great job. Thank you for presenting. And just so you know, that's what best friends do. They'll whisper in your ear and move you along. <laughs> okay, our next group of presenters to present on diabetes is Sawyer and Connor. Come on up. So we chose diabetes for our topic. We mainly cho we chose this because um, my parents both worked in medicine, and I've been pretty interested in it for my whole life. And it just seemed really interesting to me how diabetes works, how it affects your pancreas, stuff like that. Um, I think that the main reason that I chose diabetes is because 
I'm a diabetic myself, and I think it's important that we bring more awareness to the topic. So Connor can kind of explain to you what diabetes is. Diabetes affects your pancreas, an organ in your abdomen. The pancreas produces a, chem- a natural hormone known as insulin that goes into your blood and opens up cells to allow glucose to travel in through glucose tunnels. With no insulin, well, with diabetes, one of three issues occur. You don't produce insulin. You produce insulin, but it doesn't work to open up the cells. Or your cells don't accept the insulin. So the insulin works perfectly fine, but the cells don't accept it. When you have diabetes and your, your body's not, your cells are not going to enter, your, body, your liver starts to break down fat. Your liver does this as to try and compensate for the loss of energy, and the byproduct of that goes into your blood. The byproduct of that is ketones. A buildup of those ketones causes a deadly condition known as diabetic ketoacidosis. But it's preventable, and so I will explain on how to treat diabetes. Um, so basically, there's a lot of different ways that you can treat diabetes, um, but one of the main ones is by using an insulin pen. So it's basically just this little pen that you um, draw the hyaluronidase for insulin you're giving, um, and then you have to inject yourself with a food in the shop. Um, but with modern technology, um, you can use um, a thing called a pump. Um, mm-hmm. So I have a pump right here. So basically that is constantly giving me insulin to um, help maintain my blood sugar, make it a bit more steady. Um, and like right from my phone, um, if I'm eating lunch or something, I just put, put in however many carbs I'm eating and they don't give me however many units of things I need. Um, I also have a Dexcom, which is this. So basically it takes the blood of my body and it reads how much sugar is inside of my blood. Um, space for it. If my sugar is super duper high, um, then it's able to tell my pump so they communicate and work together that um, I'm super high and I need more insulin. So then the pump automatically gets me more insulin. Okay. <laughs> so our action was interviewing my um, endocrinologist and putting a fly dress for him. So basically, um, I managed to talk to my doctor, ask him some questions about um, what he thinks about diabetes, you know, how people maintain it, and the favorite part about, you know, being a diabetic doctor. And so that's not good. But also, um, we put flies up around the school with um, uh, different websites where you can donate to um, help find your cure for diabetes. I think that's it. So it does work. Great. <laughs> great job and great presentation. Thank you. Any questions or feedback? I just want to say thank you to you and to the students for it takes uh, it's you were really brave to be here <laughs> in front of all of these people and um, just really excited to um, to hear you be able to share your knowledge and your journey through this process. So thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love the display at the end where a student thought to himself, what did I miss? And it's action oriented, right? It was a pretty cool we got to see it on display that you know, we're not just learning this to learn it, we're learning it to take action. And that was pretty neat. 
All right, at this time we'll move into item number six, which is request to address the board. Um, at this time, first on my list is Renita Bonadies. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Good evening. My name's Renita Bonadies. I've been here attending school board meetings for almost three years now, only missing a couple during that time. And I've watched how the agenda has changed over the years. Early on when we submitted an email to the board, we noticed that it did not appear on the letters to the board section of the agenda. So we began submitting FOIAs and request letters by dropping them off at the administration building or mailing them through the USPS. These letters then appeared on the agenda under letters to the board. We did notice that it was rather random over the years as to whether there was a notation to, that it was a FOIA request versus a regular letter. Then several months ago, we noticed that FOIAs were no longer noted and then not even on the agenda, even when hand delivered. My FOIA request was excluded altogether from the February agenda. The March agenda, an agenda packet excluded my letter to the board. When I questioned the interim superintendent as to its exclusion, she said she thought it was of a personal nature, so it was not included. I said I thought all letters to the board were to be included. She went on to inform me that there is no policy requiring all letters to the board to be included on the agenda or in the agenda packet. This month, a letter was delivered on May 25th by my husband from us to the board. It was yet again excluded from the agenda and the agenda packet. We actually had no verification it was delivered since it was once again ex excluded. We've paid almost $700 for the agenda packets, which many other districts distribute for free. I guess now that we have been forced to pay for the agenda packets for over two years for public transparency, it's time for the superintendent to manipulate that information to the public as well. It is clear that the board's newest and only hired employee who ran on honesty, trust, and transparency has shown her true colors. There is no way the public can trust that we are being given the whole of the communications that go to the school board as we were led to believe. So I guess you can remove that spot on the agenda as it is not a true reflection of communications taking place. It is really just a listing of thank you notes sent out for donations received. You are to be the boss in this situation. Yes, the superintendent makes the agenda, but you have the authority to make this process more transparent to the public. Must we always test things to see if, we are be if you are being honest with the public? You can do better. You were elected to do better, and you owe it to the public to do so. Thank you. Next on the list is Lisa Hansen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Lisa Hansen. I am here simply representing myself. Honestly, I had planned to be done speaking, but as a parent with a Dow High senior, I'm back. I'll keep it brief because I know you've received a lot of feedback. After learning at last month's meeting that only 48% of MPS third graders are proficient in reading, I didn't think I could be more shocked. I was not only shocked with your statement regarding the senior squirt gun game, which is voluntary, played off school property, and has been going on for years locally and across the country. I was horrified by the Midland Police Department statement. Both were a gross misrepresentation of the activity and seemed like an abuse of authority. It was probably business as usual, but people are waking up and seeing it for what it is. You say you're against bullying, yet you issued a written statement trying to threaten and bully our kids into submission. I believe you're all good people. My hope is that you'll start to question whoever is guiding your decisions. I guess the upside from this experience is that our community is now aware of the game. If they see squirt gun activity off school property, they can enjoy the fun and be part of celebrating our senior class. It's too bad that community awareness wasn't your first instinct. The senior class has had to endure lockdowns, isolation, masks, and sacrifices that will forever impact them. My belief is that even though they've experienced unfair and unjust treatment, they will rise above it to become great leaders. I believe they have the greatness within them to right the wrongs, course correct, and unite our country. These kids are extra special, and my hope is that they will never let anyone or anything crush their spirit. 
Thank you, Ms. Hansen. That completes my list for tonight uh, that pre-signed up. Anybody else care to address the board? Okay. Item number seven is curriculum instruction assessment. Uh, study committee meetings, item 7.1 from March 18th. Brad? Uh, members present were myself, Ann Horowitz, Jennifer Ringgold, Penny Miller Nelson, Jen Service, and Melissa Toner, with special guests Kim Funnel, Amanda Sherry, Tracy Speaker Gerstheimer, and Joy Yang Zhao. We met at the administration building. Um, our very first topic that's covered at all of our CIA meetings is a diversity, equity, inclusion update. Joy gave a summary of recent events throughout the district, was shared with highlights including Jefferson's Voices of Our Community, Woodcrest's We Belong Night, Central Park's Pancakes, PJ's and Pages event, and the All Belong at Adams event. We then went on to curriculum and staff development proposals. Members of the CIA team presented 20 proposals that represent the key areas of need for curriculum development and professional learning for the 2024-2025 school year. The proposals will be presented for information to the Board of Education at the April meeting today, followed by action at the May meeting. Implementation will be based on available funding and begin after July 1st, 2024. Communications information aspects of the refreshed communication strategy were discussed with the committee. We also received more additional information, uh, May 7th operating millage renewal information, Information regarding the upcoming millage renewal was reviewed and discussed. Uh, we adjourned at 2.45 and we met again today, which we'll cover next time. Thank you, Brad. Item 7.2 is for information, staff, and curriculum development proposals. Penny. Yeah, I have this one. As uh, Brad just offered these 20 proposals that we're bringing to you this evening for consideration, they are for information. And I'll remind you that all of this is pending final budget approval. I am going to read these just so that we have on record exactly what these are. Uh, and again, these proposals reflect the current needs expressed uh, by administration and teachers and staff for our professional learning and curriculum focus. Instructional technology workshop for teachers. Those are workshops that happen in the summer and uh, really help advance our teacher skills in using instructional technology to support teaching and learning. We have blended learning, teacher training, artificial intelligence, instructional tech training. So you can see those three are really sort of in that same vein. Internet and social media safety. This is something that we've recognized uh, is a, a bit of a gap in our student experience, explicitly teaching information about how to be safe uh, on the internet and proper use of social media. We have a secondary ELA proposal, future teachers of tomorrow, personal finance. We need to put some final touches on that graduation requirement that's coming our way. A world geography textbook, adoption, opportunity for teachers to really dig into that resource and uh, implement that. Elementary world language, math, grades six through 12 seminar in geometry. This is an opportunity to just keep improving that math seminar experience that we've used some of our uh, supplemental funds to get started. We have a high school physics resource implementation proposal, a secondary curriculum articulation proposal, MPS resiliency, Central Park trauma-informed professional learning for kindergarten teachers specifically, math recovery, an elementary literacy partnership school proposal, PYP after school collaborative, reading and writing workshop professional development proposal. And I just wanna point out that number 16 and number 18 are two-year proposals. This is year one of what will be uh, two years and the amounts that you see, it's anticipated that the, it will be similar next year when these come back to you. Play-based learning at the pre-primary center. This is actually the second year of a two-year proposal. And then PSYOP training, which is sheltered instruction observation protocol. And this is specialized training that will uh, help teachers build skill and knowledge about how to support our multi-language learners. We used to call those English language learner students. So these total, uh, as you can see there, $536,993. We are going to, to the best of our ability, leverage existing grants. 
we don't know that for sure yet. That's why it says anticipated amount from general fund under that. We believe the MPS resiliency and the Central Park trauma informed, both of those could come from uh, some title grants. And uh, the SIOP training, we receive specialized training through Title III and Section 41. Great. And uh, one of those literacy proposals, either uh, 16 or 18 on your list, we're going to seek some title funds for those as well as much as possible. So these will come back to you next month for your action. And we welcome uh, anyone who has additional questions about those to reach out to me. I'll be happy to address that. Any questions from the board on the staff development proposals? Will 19 play-based learning pre-primary center, mm -hmm. will that be an ongoing one as well? Sim um, something similar to that every year, even though it's not a multi-year uh, yeah, contract? Uh, so the what we're working to do is really embrace that play-based philosophy. And after this second year of the proposal, we'll continue our learning, but we'll likely do that just through our typical learning structures. We won't see another proposal for that. This was just that kind of activation, energy, and resource we needed to get that started. These are all train the trainer. Right? Uh, um, I wouldn't say they're all train the trainer. Many of these are direct experiences for, for teachers. The teacher. Got it. Yes. That was actually something that we talked yeah. directly about in, in the CIA um, uh, subcommittee is about the fact that a lot of this is teacher ask yeah. um, for the additional support that they would like to see um, to help um, mm -hmm. lift up the work that they're doing and build their skill set. So. Okay. Item 7.3 for information textbook adoption. Pen. Yes, we have two textbooks that we're bringing to you tonight for information, and these will be available for the 28-day uh, review period. The first is a text that will be used in our middle schools, Exploring Geography and Global Issues. This is by McGraw-Hill with a copyright date of 2024. And the second textbook is titled American Government. The publisher is Cengage, and the copyright is 2022. That will be used in our uh, U.S. government classes in our high schools. I'll just remind you that both of these have been thoroughly reviewed by the teachers in these particular areas that teach these courses, along with the teacher leaders in those content areas, and then brought through the curriculum office process. Thank you. Any questions about textbooks? Actually, uh, item number eight is finance facilities and operations, 8.1 meeting minutes from April 8th. Mr. Lauterbach. Thank you, Phil. The committee met on April 8th. Uh, members present were uh, Brad Blazy, Scott McFarland, and Ann Horowitz, uh, who was filling in in my absence. Uh, also present were Penny, Penny Miller Nelson, Brian Brutin, <coughs> and Dave Deedzik. First item on the agenda was servers and storage. Mr. Deedzik presented information on the need to replace and enhance critical technology infrastructure. Series three bond, uh, Series 3 funds would be utilized if approved. Interactive display boards. The administration will recommend the purchase of interactive displays for Central Park and Plymouth Elementary. Title I A funds will be util utilized if approved. February financials. The February financials were reviewed. Revenue variances were attributed to the timing of receipt of winter taxes. Purchase card and purchase orders over the bid threshold were reviewed. The annual budget workshop will be facilitated at the April board meeting. Flooring. Administration will recommend awarding a contract to replace flooring at various MPS locations. Capital improvement funds will be utilized if approved. Swim scoreboard. Administration will recommend the purchase of a new video board for the MPS pool located at HH Dow High. Capital improvement funds will be utilized if approved. Robotics relocation. The committee was briefed on sites visited by the MPS team. Franklin property purchase agreement. District Council and Administration have prepared a purchase agreement aligned to proposed terms between MPS and Habitat for Humanity. It will be presented to the Board for consideration. Transportation wages. Feedback was solicited on wage rates for transportation employees for the 24-25 school year. Food service contract. Bids were sought to provide food services within MPS. The Michigan Department of Education regulates the process and has approved Administration to recommend awarding the contract to our current provider, Chartwells. The next FFO meeting will be May 6th at 5 p.m. 
Thank you, John. Uh, action item 8.2 is for action flooring. Brian. Thank you. Uh, we solicited bids to replace flooring at various locations throughout Midland Public. Uh, in the board packet, the specifications of the project scope were included. We are recommending awarding the project to Vantage Flooring and Interiors of Midland, Michigan for a total price of $81,000. And if this does have your approval this evening, we will utilize capital improvement funds. Um, going back to what I said earlier, one of the largest portions of this is some flooring updates over at the pre-primary center to replace some of those classrooms that currently have robotics in them. Take an action item for 8.2. I'll move to approve uh, item 8.2. Second. Motion by McFarland, support by Horowitz. Any questions or clarification, discussion? I, I don't recall ever seeing Vantage before. On a bid list. It's our first time working with them. Okay. Mm -hmm. so we'll Local. Michael. Yep. Double check everything. We have. Any other questions? Okay. All in favor of uh, approval of 8.2 say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item carries. 8.3 for action food service contract. Brian. Thank you. The USDA requires school districts <coughs> to bid their food service contracts every single five years. We did issue a request for proposals earlier this spring. A committee reviewed the bids through a statutory rubric and recommends the Board of Education approve a 2425 food service agreement with Compass Group USA by and through its Chartwells division. The full contractual terms were included in the board agenda. Thank you. Take a motion for 8.3. Motion by Lauterbach, support by Hatfield. Any further discussion or questions? All in favor of approval of item 8.3 say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 8.4 for action, Franklin Property Purchase Agreement. Brian. Thank you. We are excited to bring to you this evening a very unique purchase agreement um, where MPS would be selling the property, you can call it the Franklin School property, the Dower property, it has lots of names, um, to Habitat for Humanity. And you will see within that purchase agreement a unique clause that will secure a 10-year relationship between Habitat for Humanity and our Building Trades program. Um, we appreciate the work that Mr. Jaster has done on this. And Jennifer, um, thank you for coming this evening to represent Habitat for Humanity. You had to sit through lots of fun presentations um, to be able to get to this point. Um, but we are excited um, for all of the great possibilities that come out of this partnership, um, new affordable housing, and also um, a great partnership for our building trades program um, to be able to build on this for many, many, many years to come. Thanks, Brian. Um, take a motion for approval of 8.4. I move to approve um, the purchase agreement of the Franklin property um, for Habitat for Humanity. Support. Motion by Ringgold, support by Lauterbach. Any further discussion? Pretty cool opportunity for our building trades and thank you for the 10 year agreement. That's extremely exciting and many houses for our kids to build uh, for the next decade. All in favor of approval of 8.4 say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Item 8.5 for action, swim scoreboard. Brian. Thank you. Uh, quotes were solicited to add a video scoreboard over at the MPS pool that is located at Dow High. Uh, specs of the board were included in the attachments and we are recommending awarding the project to Colorado Time Systems of Loveland, Colorado for a price of $64,300. If approved this evening, we will utilize capital improvement funds. Take a motion for 8.5. Move to approve the purchase of a swim scoreboard from Colo Colorado Time Systems of Loveland, Colorado. Support. Motion by Ringgold, support by McFarland. Any discussion? I have a question, uh, Brian. Why the variance from 64,000 to 123? Yep. Are we look at 224, were we looking at the same product? We, we are, and it's complicated. Um, because the Colorado timing systems 
integrate with our current touch pads and touch boards. Whereas if you were to go with a different product through one of those other companies, um, you would have to purchase a whole package to be able to do so. We did find two companies that do this exact board. Those are your first two that you saw that were very similar. But to be able to bring in a new video board, you'd have to replace a lot of other items that go along with it as well too. It was very difficult to get an apple to apple. Um, we're kind of apple oranging here, but this was what the preferred board was of all of our swim coaches. This was their number one primary choice. If plans go right, I don't want to make 100% promises, both will be maintained. The current stack timing boards that you see on the right when you're looking in the pool will stay, integrates with the video interactive board, which will be on the opposite wall. Um, this is a big board if you look at the specs of it. I'm very excited, and I'd be remiss if I didn't also honor that we are um, going to be in receipt of a $5,000 donation from the Middle Baseball Foundation through the um, Dow High Sports Boosters to help offset some of these costs. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, John. The, good, good there's question. some highlighting in regards to timing of this um, in the agreement. What do we like? It's very wide range of when it might actually get here. Yeah, but. we're we need to order okay. tomorrow um, <laughs> <laughs> with all huge hopes that we can have this done. Um, there's some extensive electrical work that will need done as well, too, because we're placing this on an opposite wall where they're currently out the outlets as well. So we're going to do everything that we can to try and get this thing in before the fall swim season. Um, gets rolling. No promises, but we're going to try. Any further discussion or questions? All in favor of approving item 8.5, the swim scoreboard, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 8.6 for action interactive display boards, Brian and Dave. Thank you. We are seeking your approval this evening to deliver a purchase order to Bloom of Minnesota, of St. Paul, Minnesota, for $50,230. This is to provide interactive whiteboards for Plymouth Elementary and Central Park Elementary. This pricing includes eight New Line Q Pro Series interactive displays and eight Copernicus iRover 2 carts for each of the schools. The pricing is provided through the REMC bid process. It does follow our board purchasing policies. And if approved this evening, we will utilize Title I funds for the purchase. You all have seen a sneak preview of these um, during the superintendent search when we were interactive. It's those boards. Um, newer version of them, right, Dave? Thank you. Um, but same concept. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Um, take a motion for 8.6. I move for approval of item 8.6, uh, purchase of interactive display boards. Support. Motion by Hatfield, support by McFarland. Any questions or discussion on 8.6? So those 16 add to how many that we already have? We have five right now. Okay. Cool. Anything else? It's only eight, but it's a, it's a, it's a eight boards and then there's eight bases and they go together, right? Eight for each it, it's eight for each school, but okay. it's total 16. 16 total carton monitor combo. Okay. All in favor of 8.6, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 8.7 for action, servers and storage, Brian and Dave. Certainly going to lean on Dave for his expertise should you have questions. Um, but we are seeking approval this evening to deliver a purchase order to CDW Government of Chicago, Illinois for $447,700.62. This will include replacement of our five remaining six-year-old virtual server hosts and our five-year-old storage environment. The new hardware includes six Dell R760 servers, three Dell PowerStore 500T storage area networks, and external tape drive and four network switches. The pricing provided was through the REMC bid. It does follow our board purchasing policy, and this purchase was planned as a part of our Series 3 2015 bond. Any, um, take a motion for approval of 8.7. I'll move to approve the purchase of the new servers and storage. Support. Motion by Horowitz, support by Ringgold. Any further discussion? Dave, thank you for being so patient at the FFO meeting. <laughs> I've asked many questions about things I don't know about. <laughs> you guys all did great. That was, that was awesome. 
similar to other things we've purchased in the past, what kind of timing do you do? You They're saying well, we can have everything by June, Wonderful. which is good. We want to have the work done by July at the latest. It takes about a month to do. Okay. All in favor of item 8.7, servers and storage, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 8.8. .8. For action gifts totaling twelve thousand two hundred eighty two dollars Brian we are seeking your approval this evening to accept two gifts on behalf of MPS both coming from the Midland High School Booster Club uh, you'll see one is five thousand dollars for huddle that is a software subscription that all the coaches use for scouting and another for seven thousand two hundred eighty two dollars for a basketball rebounding machine thanks Brian I'll take a motion for approval of 8.8 .8. I'll move to approve item 8.8. .8. I'll support. Motion by McFarland, support by Hatfield. Any further discussion? Other than thank you. All in favor of approving the gifts in item 8.8 .8, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. 8.9 for information gifts totaling $10,175.13. Brian. Thank you. Um, for information only this evening, we are happy to acknowledge, as you just stated, seven gifts totaling $10,175.13. They support a wide range of items from sports equipment to field trips and also robotics. Per tradition, all the donors will be honored in the credits of this evening's broadcast and also through board correspondence. We remain grateful for the community's support. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Item number nine is human resources. Um, Item 9.1, Jeff, for information. Thanks, Bill. Yep, for information, the board and our MPS staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of Miss Mary E. Grigorczyk. Uh, she passed away March 27th, 2024. Mary was employed by MPS Food Services um, at the time with Central Middle School and then later Midland High School. She retired in 1995 with 18 years of service. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> item number 10 are co uh, correspondence to and from the Board of Education. Item 10.1 for information, the letters from the Board of Education to the three organizations listed in the agenda packet. Item number 11 are scheduled activities for information. 11.1, uh, all meetings are regular and special meetings of the Board of education and begin at 7 p.m. unless otherwise noted. The dates are listed in your agenda packet. Finally, um, item number 12 would be study session discussion. Um, are there any points of clarification from board members? Just have a couple myself. Um, We obviously have to negotiate Penny's uh, contract, which I'll bring back to the board um, for the next board meeting. And that'll be in your agenda packet to review. Um, and obviously let me know if you have any direct questions. Um, so I'll bring that back in May. And then was thinking that it would be best then to bring back the review for the June meeting. So the uh, superintendent evaluation for June. Um, and then finally, we, we, Brian touched on it a little bit, but we do have um, information cards about the current election. Some of you may have received the, your absentee ballot this weekend. Um, please do your due diligence on this. You know, the, it is a renewal with two parts, as Brian talked about earlier tonight, both the non-homestead millage and the hold. Hard, home, hold harmless millage, thank you for my, your patience. Um, altogether, these generate about $20 million for the district, which is nominally 15 to 20% of our operating budget. When you think about 85% of our expenditures are direct salary, um, you can pretty quickly put together what would happen if we lost 20% of our budget. Um, so please make sure that you're evaluating this reach out to any of your board members or, or Penny directly if you have any questions about 
the um, the millage. I think it's really important to note that we, when we think of schools, we don't just think of our educational classroom and instruction time, but all of the other things that go around with schools, whether it's athletics, robotics, learning a different world language, experiencing voices of our community, all of those things are made possible by the local community supporting us through those $20 million. So please uh, consider that as, as you uh, vote um, either on or before May 7th. Any other board members before I turn the floor over to Penny? I, I will note for the community, we're gonna do um, final announcement from Penny now, if you have anything else to share, and then we'll move into closed session for attorney-client privilege, but. Hi, everyone. I'll just remind us as the school year winds down that there is no shortage of awesome school events for you to attend, whether it's spring athletics. Uh, we saw tonight the exhibition of Central Park Elementary. Other, school, other elementary schools will be hosting their exhibitions, uh, which you're welcome to attend. There will be uh, additional, I think Midland High has a musical here soon, if not this weekend, very soon and lots of other music uh, events. So no shortage of awesome celebrations of the great things happening here. And Sarah and I will make sure that you have some of those dates and times should you have any opportunity to attend those. I'll also just a shout out to um, our staff and our students and our parents and families. We are in the midst of testing season, the Michigan Merit exam in its various forms from elementary up through grade 11. And uh, it's, it's a heavy lift. It certainly alters what this day of school looks like and creates um, just some wrinkles in that. So everyone's flexibility is really appreciated. Those assessments are important. It's a good snapshot of where we are as a district. And we take those seriously, but we also remind ourselves that it is one measure of how we define our success here in Midland and we'll look forward to sharing that data with you when it's available and public. Great, thanks Penny. Item number 13 is a proposal to go into closed session for consideration of attorney-client privileged communication regarding a legal opinion. Anybody wish to make a motion for closed session? I move that we go into closed session uh, for consideration of attorney-client privilege and information. Support. Motion by Hatfield, support by Horowitz. John, do you mind doing a roll? Yes, please. <clears throat> roll call, roll, please. President Rausch? Yes. Vice President McFarland? Yes. Secretary Hatfield? Is yes. Treasurer Lauterbach? Yes. Member Blazy? Yes. Member Ringgold? Yes. Member Horowitz? Yes. Unanimous. Okay. We'll move, move into closed session. All right, we're back into open session now. Um, the, is there a motion? Ann? Go ahead. Yep. Um, following our closed session, I'm going to make a motion to extend counsel the authority to resolve the pending litigation with MPS. Support. Motion by Horowitz. Support by Lauterbach to extend counsel the to go settle for us on the pending litigation. Any further discussion or clarification? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Finally, I'll take a motion to adjourn. We adjourn. Motion Support by Hatfield. Heart. Support by Lauterbach. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Stand adjourned. <laughs>